Well, the comments section is going to be really fun on this one because today on Twin Cam, it is a City Rover. Yay! This is the kind of car you usually find in one of those magazine articles written by a so-called journalist about the top 10 worst cars ever, or top 10 ugliest cars ever, or anything of that ilk, the City Rover will undoubtedly make an appearance. And there are a few good reasons why. This was the wrong car, built at the wrong time, and by the wrong company. It's also completely ironic. But none of these things make this a particularly bad car, but certainly not a good car. The City Rover was launched in 2003 as the first all new Rover model since the genuinely brilliant 75 launched in 1998. I'll put a link to that video in the corner. But this wasn't really a Rover at all. The engineers at Longbridge had very little influence on this car. It was, in reality, a mildly facelifted Tartar Indica. The Tartar was launched in 1998 and it was pretty successful in its home country of India. It was a low cost, highly equipped, inoffensive little car. But in 2003 Britain, that wouldn't wash. Maybe if it was launched as a Tartar, as a really, really cheap little car, it might have somehow worked. But it had a long ship badge grafted onto the front end and a relatively hefty price tag attached. The upheaval really started when it was rumoured that Rover were paying Tartar £3,000 for every car then charging the British public £6,495 for the most basic City Rover. This was compounded by the fact that Rover cut the price by 900 quid in December 2004, admitting in the process that they cocked up the pricing initially. The City Rover very quickly became a laughing stock, the butt of the joke, and seemingly for very good reason. When Top Gear tried to review one back in 2003, Rover apparently wouldn't lend them one and in 2013 their sister magazine named it as one of the worst cars of the last 20 years. But that's Top Gear, and an awful lot of misguided rubbish comes out of that TV show and magazine. I think it's time to take a good old look at the last new car to carry that once famous and aspirational Viking longship on the front. As if the Rover brand hadn't been stained enough by the 70s, 80s and the asset stripping done by BMW, they then decided to launch a five-year-old Indian economy car. This doesn't sound anything like the company that in the late 90s was talking about building a new dynasty of luxurious, aspirational cars stemming from the examples set by the Rover 75. But what this does sound like is a company that was dying. Less than two years later, it finally was. MG Rover really was clutching at straws when they decided to pull themselves down a couple of pegs in a faint hope of survival. However, it does make quite a bit of sense. Here is a sellable, cheap Super Mini to fill a gap in the MG Rover range and inject something into the range that was missing from before. All that coupled with the fact that development costs were nearly zero and this was a really, really good opportunity for MG Rover. It's just a shame it didn't quite pan out that way. Before we take a look, here's the irony. In 2003, Tartar was introduced to the UK market by Rover. In 2008, Tartar bought Rover. And 10 years later, we have Jaguar Land Rover doing its thing, launching exciting new cars like the Jaguar I-Pace. Taking a look at the exterior, it isn't such a bad looking little thing. It's a tall one box design with a couple of nice little stylistic touches to it. The original Tata was penned by the same Italian styling house that did the Fiat Tipo and the Alpha 155, so not bad company there. The front end is quite sharp, I like the headlights and the Rover corporate grille gives it a bit of identity. At the side it's a little bit too tall and flat to say it's a good looking car, but at least it isn't completely slab sided. 
These door handles are a little bit old hat as well, but the smart little 14 inch alloys are a nice addition. At the back you have these long rear lights. They allow for a wider rear door and the safer. The thinking, as used in lots of cars, is that the higher your rear lights are, the more likely the prats in the Chelsea tractors are to see them. For the rest of the rear end though, it's all a little bit anonymous really. I do like the big letters across the boot lid though, and that neatly brings us to the name City Rover. That's a great name, distinctive, purposeful, just as good as Land Rover or Range Rover for going off road. This is a City Rover, perfectly descriptive. A City Rover is a City Rover. The City Rover's styling is quite a bit more distinctive and sharp compared to the Indica, which looks a little bit plain in comparison. There weren't that many changes between the two cars, the most notable part being that Rover grill. All City Rovers were built by Tata at their plant in India, and then shipped over to Britain where the final tweaks were made at Longbridge. There are a lot of stories that say that MG Rover engineers were not impressed with the Indica, and they wanted to change a number of things, including the suspension, gear change and dashboard. But with the upper hand, Tata simply said no. They conceded at a modified suspension, but almost everything else barring trim was unchanged. Even the steering wheel, which has the shape for the Tata logo stamped into it, and then the Rover longship awkwardly placed within. The engineering that went into the car isn't worth writing home about as such, but Rover's engineers fitted a quicker steering rack and fitted stiffer springs that lowered the car by 20mm, among a few other tweaks. The engine was the same 1.4 litre unit as the Indica, derived from a PSA engine I'm led to believe. It makes a very healthy 85 brake horsepower, propelling it from 0 to 60 in 11.9 seconds. And that isn't slow, it's more than 2 seconds quicker than a brand new Toyota Raigo. The City Rover therefore did have a bit of get up and go about it when compared to other cars of the same type. And now I'm sat inside the City Rover and I can say that I'm not impressed one bit. This can only be described in one way. It is terrible. It's a shockingly bad interior. Everything is badly put together, it's badly designed, and the driving position is utterly, utterly shocking. This is the closest I've, I've managed to get it. Um, but still, I am way too high in the car. Um, does the steering column adjust? Nope, steering column doesn't adjust. So the steering wheel is too close to me, but it's also at completely the wrong rake as well. The pedals are in completely the wrong position for me. But also, if we move around a little bit, the gear knob, which is also in a weird position. Everything just feels wrong in this car. I haven't been able to find a decent driving position. The seats aren't even particularly comfy. They're very hard. They seem to have no real support. Absolutely no shoulder support. No side to side support at all. They just seem to be very, very cheap, badly designed and badly made as well. If we look in front of us, we have this flat slab of steering wheel, uh, four spoke design, quite ugly, but you'll notice this indent here is for a Tata logo, but obviously this is a Rover, not a Tata. So the Rover longship is just squished into the space here. So. That's another bit of cheapening out. Well done, Rover. And the dials in front of you, yes, they're white. Yes, they're trying to make them look slightly sporting, but they don't look very impressive, to be honest. You have tachometer, speedometer, analog odometer, though, an analog trip, which is quite, quite old hat by 2003, and fuel gauge and water temperature gauge. So at least you have a decent enough complement of dials you do sit very high in the car, which may please some people, but it doesn't please me. It's, as I said, not very comfortable, and it certainly doesn't feel like a car you want to drive very quickly. But the dashboard itself is quite practical, but it's not very good looking or well built. You have this nice shelf here with a mat that really does want to fly away. So there is a little bit of storage here. You have a digital clock at the end here. You do have a passenger airbag, so that's a luxury, I suppose, but it's all very, 
very cheap and very, very nasty. You do have a very, very nicely sized glove box though. So again, it is a practical car for the price of a City Rover nowadays. I suppose you could live with that kind of quality, but realistically, I would never want to own a car with this level of quality. But then you do get little cup holders in here. So that's something I guess, again, just the quality just is not there. It doesn't just feel like a cheap car. It feels like a nasty car. I mean, even these bits of silver here all just look really cheap. And the heater controls all feel like they're setting something. Even the recirculation switch feels flimsy and cheap. It's just not very nice. And yes, this Panasonic radio is standard fit, but it's just not very nice. It's it looks like a very, very cheap aftermarket stereo. You have an ashtray underneath, of course, which is of a decent size, and a cigarette lighter next to it. You do have a nice little cubby hole here. But you have this same silver down the centre here, and the switch for the passenger airbag is just sat here in the centre console. It's not a very nice place. And we move naturally down to the gear shift, which is known as a sore point of the City Rover, and I can say, yeah, the gear change is really appalling. I've just come out of a Reliant Robin and the gear change on the Reliant Robin is so much nicer than it is in a City Rover. So if we now have a little look at the stalks here, they're, yeah, I just, there's no quality there. It all feels very, very cheap. Now, of course you have left indicator and right indicator, and then your flash, and then your main beam, and your lights on there. On the other side are your wipers, and if we pull for a mist function, and then down for intermittent, which is controlled via this little knob here. That there has to be the highest quality feeling thing in the entire car. And then you have first speed, second speed. If we go back down to off, that is your wash here. The controls for the rear wiper are down at the side here on this quality bit of plastic here. That's your rear wiper. Heated rear window and fog lights next to it. You do get instrument illumination control there. And the other side on this weird little switch, to be honest, is your headlamp aim and yes these chrome pedals are apparently the original pedals it does seem curious in a car so cheap that these metallic pedals would be standard but they are just as another example of the cheapness of this car that is the mirror in the passenger sun visor i mean This really is not a very good quality car. The door cards predictably are grey plastic. You do get a little bit of material here though. Um, and keep fit windows in this Sprite model. Electric windows on the higher spec versions would have been in the middle here, I'm led to believe. In the back, however, things are a bit of a different story. Yes, it's still very Spartan. There isn't anything very much to speak of on the door cards. You don't get proper rear headrests, there are just these built-in little things to the rear of the seats. But what you do get is an awful, awful lot of room. This is a very, very small car, but Tata managed to get an awful lot of room out of it. So you see, I have quite a lot of rear leg room. And also as it's a very tall car, I have a lot of headroom as well. I do also get a grab handle. So the place to be in a City Rover is in the back, because if you were driving this car, you'd be very, very disappointed. But in the back, for such a small car, you're not doing too, too badly. Now this City Rover is a relatively special one because it is one of the original press cars from 2003 when the City Rover was launched. And with that comes some brilliant bits of press documentation, which I'm about to show you. So here in this wallet is the press information for the last ever Rover car. And if we open it up, we see 
that it is press information for both the City Rover and the Rover Streetwise, which were launched about the same time. You see, the dates are both the 8th of July, 2003. And within, you have some very nicely staged press photos of the car on. And here is a price list for the City Rover. Of course, this was known for being a very cheap car, but we see on the road price ranging from £6,495 to £8,895 for the style. Now, that kind of price for a City Rover is rather absurd because... Even with all the trim that the style model gets you, £8,895 is a heck of a lot of money for what it is. Now, as a car that gets you from point A to point B, it's not that bad of a car. They're really cheap, they're reasonably reliable, and they're one of the most practical cars you can buy in the class. And in a nice red like this one, or a metallic grey with the nice alloy wheels, it's not a bad looking little car. But would I buy one? No, absolutely not. It's just too cheap. It doesn't drive very well, it's not very comfortable, it doesn't do anything very well as such. There's nothing that this car stands out for, it's just very cheap. And sometimes that can be a good thing, but in this case, it's just a little bit too on the side of nasty than the side of cheap. And this was typical own goal stuff for Rover. It's a car that could have been quite successful, it's a car that could have been really quite good. But instead, it was too cheaply made, the concessions weren't made by Tata, and Rover ended up launching a car that was already five years old, and the engineering of which was already out of date even then. And when the Fiat Panda was launched in 2003, it made the City Rover look enormously old hat, and the Top Gear gaff just made things even worse for them. This is the car that could have been the Dacia Sandero five years earlier. And as I said in my Land Crab video, Typical. Typical Rover. The City Rover wasn't a terrible car. Far from it. But it was just underwhelming. And unfit to carry that Viking longship badge on the front. People were annoyed enough in 1990 when Rover stuck their badge on the front of a Metro. But at least the Metro was a really good little car. Considered the best in the class by Autocar. But the City Rover just wasn't. There's nothing in this car that screams Rover at me. And that's a bit of a shame, I think, because if it was launched as a Tartar, it wouldn't be considered a great car, because it isn't. But it would be considered better, because it would have been Tartar's first entry into the British market. And it could be forgiven for being a cheap, utilitarian car. Thank you very much for watching. And as you made it to the end of the video, why not think about liking it and maybe subscribing as well. It really helps everything that I do and encourages me to make more videos like this. Hopefully, I'll see you in a future video.